This is the internal customer call for the testing group, uh, May 27, 2021. Uh, I'm going to kick off the agenda real quick. Um, there's a couple of change, a couple of changes in the roadmap deck. Uh, things of note: code quality is being handed off as a category um, over to the static analysis team. The customer, the vision, the roadmap, the feature set all aligns really, really nicely with um, what they're going to go build next and some of what they've already built. So what we are wrapping up as a team before we complete that handoff is changing from our MVC for code quality and our diff annotations uh, to be in line instead of in the header. Uh, we're going to be delivering a minimum viable change uh, is a not code climate scan um, to uh, then output that data as a code climate.json so it can be read in all of our features kind of as a proof of concept for customers who want to run without docker and docker so they could use things like super linter or other linters instead of the single code climate part of that is another issue that we'll deliver in 14.1 that allows multiple reports across jobs to be pulled together as long as they're the code climate.json format and all be pulled into our feature set so the mr diff sorry the mr widget already utilizes that today, but the full report in the MR diff will utilize that after 14.1. So once we've delivered that, we'll finish up that handoff and uh, refocus our efforts on performance testing, hopefully. Um, so that was in there, talked about code climate uh, handing off. I was really excited about code quality being handed off. Apparently I made it to agenda items, wanted to make sure everybody knew. Um, and then dog fooding items, that does or will wrap up the code quality in the MR diffs. I saw Scott had closed out some of the things that were on the dog fooding board, um, but we can definitely uh, revisit as need be um, just to make sure that everything is covered there. Um, so that was everything for me. Uh, Kyle, I know you wanted to talk prioritizing failed tests. I thought that was a good um, what's next when it comes to dog fooding, uh, because your team has a lot of interest. Um, I did not get a chance to grab the issue that we've been corresponding in to add it to the agenda, but I can go hunt that down. Uh, I will track it down. Cool. Uh, cause I think I've put it in about four different one-on-one -on -one docs, uh, <laughs> throughout the week. Um, yeah, so it came up in the key review and if you, um, if you watch that, I'll say, uh, very great discussion between Sid and myself, um, where where it's it's pretty clear that we're measuring the something that is not uh, what Sid thinks is the right measurement, and um, and he's he's a little disappointed that we haven't we haven't prioritized this higher, uh, to put it to put it nicely. Um, but and when I say we, it's more about. Um, you know, we, we haven't really moved forward with an experiment. So I, I at the bottom of the issue, I kind of asked with some ideas based on the where we left left off the current status. I think this is something I'd like to at least have the team make some progress on over the next few milestones, probably 14.1, when I say the team, EP team, to be clear here. Because uh, I, I don't think, uh, when I looked at the roadmap deck, it didn't seem like there was any interest from your team in building a feature around this. Um, and James, I guess it, um, I, it, it seemed to me that us proving out some solution, like us proving the value was more where we had left this feature off. Is, was that a fair summary? Yeah, I think um, we haven't seen customer demand for this as much as we have for identification of flaky tests. Like when it comes mm -hmm. to analyzing the previous test run, where we're seeing the customer demand is around, show me that this is a flaky test so I can go fix it and it doesn't cause a lot of strife in the future versus right. I just went and fixed this test, run it first to make sure I got my fix right and exactly. then run the rest of the pipeline, which it seems like that's how I parse apart those two use cases. Um, but let me know if I, there's some nuance in there that I'm missing. Yeah, so there were two interesting things in the discussion that were new nuggets for me. So some of the things that I think I'll say we're new information is we're not, we used to talk about this with respect to short circuiting the pipeline and stopping everything. We, we are not doing that. It's just run it and see what information we can do and see how maybe other productivity indicators may adjust uh, with respect to mm -hmm. this information being uh, surfaced to engineers. Um, 
and then um, uh, so it's just going to be an additional job where we run the tests that failed previously in the MR um, all, right at the start of the pipeline and just again look at the behavior of how, how soon they get fixed, how many pipelines as an example are running within the MRs uh, before they get fixed. Those, those sort of indicators are things that we may look at. Um, I think it may be hard to make a deterministic um, uh, assessment uh, out of that, but we need to try something. I, I yeah. guess like it's, it's time to try something. So let, we're, that's what we're gonna do. So I'm curious about what's the outcome that that's driving? Like at the end of the day, why are we gathering that data to, what's the behavior we wanna change among developers or the business outcome that we want from surfacing this data to them? One of the interesting things that came up in the discussion is it, it may lead to product improvements where we surface failures earlier to developers. So the, the measurement that we have is looking at total pipeline duration instead of when does the first build within your pipeline fails because developers are notified when the pipeline completes unless you're like looking at your to-dos as an example. Um, that's when you would see a build failed. You don't, um, there's no notification if, unless you're just looking at your pipeline, you have to just be looking and we don't want to train people to, we don't want an indicator to train people to like, look at your pipeline that's running, don't do anything else and then act when you see a failure. Um, so we geared on pipeline duration. We're gonna shift that, that indicator and with the experiment, we want to just, wow, never mind. I just lost sight of your question, James. I'm sorry, it's been kind of a hectic day. What was your okay. question? Holy. Well, so, and maybe I missed something. I, what I heard previously was that we will not short circuit the pipeline. So, mm -hmm. um, so the way that I understand this is that we're gonna create a new job that runs all of the tests that failed previously, we'll run mm -hmm. those first. If all of those, pass great the rest of your pipeline is passing but even if they if they fail then the pipeline should fail but will it also short circuit the rest of the jobs in flight um and say hey these are still failing like you still have problems in the tests that you just wrote it will not okay. it, it's it's essentially just gonna it's gonna try to be an early signal that it they they failed ideally um that's where i'm saying Josh Joshua was on CEO Shadow, and he raised the question when I when I was talking about we we're not going to short circuit the pipeline. We geared the KPI on pipeline duration uh, because developers aren't notified. He said he asked, "Oh, there's no build notification. I don't know if we have a feature for that. I'll create an issue." Yeah. Um, that's where there may be product notification, like there may be a change in the product features. Um, I don't know ultimately where this experiment is going to go. To be honest, I just think it's something that we're going to try to do and look at other productivity indicators to see what we're going to glean. Um, so yeah, my, my follow on question to that was then, what are we trying to influence with the feature? Is it like the mean time to merge or the time to merge? How long is it taking there? Is it, an, and you talked about new functionality or a new innovation in the product. Is it, you know, additional feature creation? I just, yeah, <laughs> help, help me understand. What are you trying to do, Kyle? Uh, you know, um, I want to see the effect on mean time to merge and the number of pipelines that are run to merge MRs, I'll, I'll say. Um, I am not convinced there is an effect, but there are other stakeholders who are looking at this metric who think there is going to be an effect on those metrics. Um, and I think it is because of those stakeholders believe there's an effect. I believe that it's worth um, doing an experiment to see. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm not, I don't get to say uh, necessarily all the time what the team gets to work on. Sometimes there's other, other people who, uh, who uh, have a say. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> okay, um, so, so we're going to make a, um, 
so go ahead, Drew. Sorry, I was just, I, and tell me, I may have missed something. I've been like, I'm trying <laughs> to follow along with like what we're, have been versus want to look at. I just thought of is, would it be an interesting metric to look at the time between a build failure and the, and a new pipeline created on that branch? as yeah. a signal of how quickly is a developer responding to a failed test. Yeah, we could right. do that. Um, I just, I mean, cause it's a little bit funny of a, it's like an attention management outcome. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a, it's a little bit weird to put like a, a size sense chart on like, are people, how to, how are people paying attention? Um, but that could give us uh, some kind of high level view on how, how quickly are, are, is somebody iterating on a test failure? The other, the, I'll, I'll say like the, the metric that I was gonna look at to try to measure something similar was like number of canceled pipelines per MR. Cause like, that's where, that's where like, if someone's looking at that MR widget, they may just push something up and just be like, oh, I see that already failed. I'm just gonna commit push and then it, yeah, it should yeah. cancel itself. Um, but I like your idea of like build time between pipeline start, build failure time between pipeline start. It'll be a little more intricate, but it may be more revealing. Um, whereas like cancel pipeline is just, there's way more factors <laughs> um, on that. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you know, cancel, it's, they're both, they, I think the, that also gets at the same action, just in a in a different way, but yeah, much more indirectly, right? Whereas, like what you're talking about is capturing the signal a little bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and if if that's what there's if there's um, uh, if if that's the thing stakeholders are interested in, that might be a a, a cool thing, a cool metric to see move is what yeah. I'm. So what you would see is across our collection of merge requests, here's a, how long it took between the time a job failed and the time the next pipeline, sorry, the time the pipeline failed and then the time the next pipeline started. Specifically when the build, the build failed. failed. When the build yeah. failed, sorry, when, okay. Um, and it would probably right. be like, I think what we would use cause we're gearing that performance indicator on first build failure, we'd probably mm -hmm. gear on the same thing. So the first pipe, the pipeline build failure from the previous MR right. pipeline. So then, I mean, to get to that outcome, what you want to do is you want to run the jobs that you think are going to fail the fastest. And then you want to get the notification to the developer as quickly as you can without them staring at their to-dos. Yeah, exactly. Like without them staring at their to-dos or at just at the pipeline. Like that's the thing is we want to, I, yeah, I don't know. We want, we want them to stay in a state of flow um, and not interrupt. This is where I'm kind of like, to be honest, this is where this is where I'm saying like, um, I'm kind of torn because I feel that it takes developers out of the flow state where mm -hmm. if they context switch into something else, um, I almost feel that some of the, like this is where our metrics could kind of may work for some developers and not for others. Like yeah. some people might just want to like tunnel vision on one thing and see it all the way through. Other people may want to push five things forward. Um, so this is where our metrics can be weaponized. Yeah, it, it sounds like there's two types of workflows. One is I'm just going to stare at the pipeline anyway because I want to iterate through this as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. Or I might even create a custom job that just runs these three tests. And that is already part of my workflow so that I can iterate. I am on this MR until it is done. Yep. Or the person who just, they run the standard pipeline and completely context switch into something else because they know either it's gonna be green after an hour or it's gonna fail, but now they have an hour of time or even overnight that they can then move on to something else. And this creates almost that different, you're gonna get a failure, but maybe in like 20 minutes. And if you were already staring at the pipeline, you're gonna know just as soon as you would have before. If you weren't, then you're gonna get a notification that potentially pulls you out of flow of the other thing. Yeah, hey Kyle. Yeah. To your, to your comment too, I, I think the, the two different ways to look at it uh, being narrow focus versus um, multitasking in effect 
is that um, it, it depends really on cognitive load uh, to mm -hmm. a great degree. To a great degree, because some of our developers they they can do that because they know all the things they're working on, like the back of their hands. They've been in it for years, um, and it's easy for them to switch from one to the other. So I, I, you, you are going to have a variance between developers. But yeah. I think if if you give the the ability to opt out of that notification, that's fine. But if you do that, then everybody's going to still fall into those two camps. Um, yeah. And there's probably a completely different way of workflow that the majority of our developers tackle, but those are the first two that pop to mind for me. So I'm thinking to myself, we, we already have notifications. Like when, when I have a tab open and a pipeline is running, it says, hey, pipe, I have like a badge or whatever. I don't remember what, what the term is. Like a, my browser does this notification on my system no matter which tab I'm on, it'll say like, hey, you have a pipeline running now. Um, I don't know if we have one for like, hey, your build, there's a build fail thing. I think that would be a useful thing because it only does it if you have that tab open and if you still care about that pipeline. So I feel like if you don't want to know, if you don't care, you'll go check on it, then you can just close the tab. But if you do care, maybe you can just leave the tab open. That's like an opt-in, opt-out of the notification mm -hmm. yeah i i think we're kind of getting like i almost just want to start with the experiment and see how see how things go and then we can kind of look at how we work it into the product um i think um like i look at like build level failure notifications um could be like slack notifications you know like like they could be super overwhelming at times um, especially like if I think the GitLab pipelines, there are like when master is broken <laughs> and we do merge results pipelines, um, you could just be getting failure like or like if and I'm thinking exceptional situations. So I shouldn't be applying the, the exception to the norm here. I don't know. Right. No, I was just thinking if you even if you have one or like a bunch of build fails. It would just be like one notification on the first build that fails. You yeah, get just one the first notification. One. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, hopefully our experiment. And and to be clear here, like James, your questions, your question you kicked this off with is perfect because I, uh, we, I don't really have a. I kind of was hoping to get started on like what features can we leverage from that your team has already worked on to so that we can build the tooling to do the experiment and we're even diving further than that into the call. So this has been great. Um, and then looking ahead to provide feedback to, would the notify, like I don't even, with all the changes in ver verify, where would those notifications, do you know what product team the notifications would fall to? Is that still in like pipeline, what's pipeline execution now or is that somewhere else? I'd imagine that'd be pipeline execution. I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I like that idea that you had there, Scott, of just like the first build failure, just having that be the first iteration of a notification, like a browser notification. First build failure in your pipeline, you can opt into that as a browser notification. That'd be pretty cool. So the, like there's a Slack integration today at what point in a pipeline, when the pipeline is going to fail, does that trigger? My understanding is it's when the pipeline finishes, but I could be wrong here. Is it this? Is it tied to the same event as when you get a to do? Because the to do is like a build. first build failed, right? Yeah. So. Um, I thought it was the to-do generates, and this is when we first built the KPI, which was probably about two or three months ago. What the, the person on the EP team found was to-do was generated on build failure. Emails and those notifications were sent at pipeline end when they were like finished, passed, um, like everything was keyed on pipeline completion. And um, 
that was why we geared that PI on total pipeline, like on pipeline completion, because most of the developer feedback was was pipeline completion. But James, what'd you find? Uh, it looks like the a pipeline status change triggers the Slack notification. So then it would, like pipeline has to get to a end state before you'll get a Slack notification. So it seems like if we can get that end state faster, then that gets you what you want through existing notification mechanism. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we were talking about short circuiting it and canceling yeah. it when we had these failures before. And that's where we got the overwhelming feedback from a lot of maintainers who are like, no, we don't want that. And, and I'm not trying to put people like, I'm not trying to just say maintainers didn't want that, but that was who we solicited feedback from. And it was yeah. overwhelming. Please don't do this. Was the maintainer use case, I mean, are we trying to drive, um, trying to drive that metric for maintainers? Or are we trying to drive that metric for non-maintainers? That would be my question because the workflow could be different. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we asked the question to maintainers because they're like our go-to for like, let's solicit some general feedback. Yeah. Who should we go to first? Um, like who, who's a group to, to solicit? We don't have like a, a great way to solicit uh, different cohort feedback. I'll sure. say like a representative sample. Hey, Maybe I, that's I wonder if we can get some feedback through just like a poly survey in Slack in development yeah. and say, you know, give them a couple of the different outcomes um, or just the extremes and, you know, ask for how would you prefer this feedback as part of your day to day development flow? And then similarly, how would you prefer this feedback as part of your maintainer or co review or whatever the other workflow is that maybe fits for a maintainer differently. I guess I, I just, I'm trying to tease out, are maintainers doing that as part of, yep, I've approved this and I've hit the merge button or put it on the merge train. And then I don't want that notification at that point or as part of day-to-day -day, day -day development of new features or bug fixes. Yeah, it, it would be interesting. The, the general feedback is when someone starts development of an MR, they want to know everything that's wrong at that point in time versus just the first thing that's wrong and just play a progressive game of fix the next problem. Um, um, yeah. Which I think I is pretty good more feedback. With that. Yeah. I was uh, thinking this is like a high level thing. It's probably like too big to tackle immediately, um, but it'd be nice to have like a new status of failed but still running pipeline where it'd be like a red circle instead of the blue one like the this running one but it's red or something like that It'd be nice yeah we've been teasing out this concept of like a like a deferred failure um so like Fo foss broken is like a really good example and maybe drew you may know about this but like we let there's one i think actually right now that i was looking into right before the call um we'll let things merge into the canonical repo that'll break foss gilab foss uh, that we used to prevent because it's so infrequent, um, but then we'll revert those MRs usually if, if there's not like a clear fix. Um, but what we wanna work towards is just testing those automatically next, like just testing those downstream as a follow-up and then opening up an automated corrective action. Um, so it's not the same exact concept, but I think the similar thing applies where it's uh, um, like you almost have like a, something goes through like all of the checks that are allowed and then there's still some that run that may create an automated action that comes out of it. Um, like an automated remediation action that comes out of it. Got it, so it's like you have a failed job but you wanna to get to the conditional job that will, that will check if we, want to automate something based on the previous failed jobs that we were seeing yeah so like a like a, um, a low risk failure that that we could allow that goes into master but we want to fix within a certain amount of time got it
Any help yeah, I think fixing my interpreted in notes would be helpful. <laughs> I don't think I captured that very well, y'all. Sorry. Yeah, I think my um, proposal was just like an easy, because when you're on the pipeline page or the merge request page, one of the things is like, if you're looking at it, it's gonna be blue and you don't know whether a job has failed without like clicking on jobs. It'd be nice if it turned red as soon as a build failed. It's still oh, running, but it's like red. It doesn't have to wait to completion to like change that status. And then you can also have a Slack integration of like if you want to be notified on that status change, because that's that's how the Slack integration works on, on status changes. So like the pipeline overall status or the stage level status? Pipeline overall status would be uh, um, if a if a job is not allowed to fail, then that that pipeline is still running, but it's like a red uh, version of the same icon. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good. So instead of short circuiting and failing the entire pipeline, you let the rest of the pipeline run, but you get the notification that something has failed, and you can go start to look at that thing first, and potentially cancel the pipeline by pushing up a fix on your own. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think a job ever leaves the failed state. I'm trying to poke holes in why we might, like how we might jump the gun by doing a bunch of reporting while the pipeline's still running. But I, I don't think it's, I don't think there's like false positive risk in sending out the notification early. Like if you have a failed build, your pipeline will fail. Is there any case where that's not true? I mean, if you retry a job, but you, then by then you already know, and then we can just reset the status when you retry a job, like we do yeah. already, I feel like. Yeah, that's that, that works the same way today. The only thing would be if that job is allow failure and you get that, but you could work that into the business logic of don't change right. the status of the pipeline if you fail the job that is allow failure, only do it right. on the nons. Yeah, we are, we already do that for pipelines. For that. Like okay. all that all that exists. So Yeah, I think it's so just yeah, that there I'm, is an auto retry for that job and it does then pass. But you're gonna potentially see that too, or maybe you don't send it then is, if there's a retry. How is auto retry turned on? Is, is it, that a YAML config? I mean, I could be imagining that this is a feature. <laughs> there is like a retry config in the YAML that I like, I, my understanding is if the job fails, it just starts it back at the beginning. Right. Yeah. I mean, we definitely we'll have a way to to sort that out. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we could we could get this working for jobs that just don't have retry configured. You know, that's easy enough to do. And then we can, you know, like there's there's iteration we could take to get there. But yeah, no, this this sounds good. I'm I'm I don't think that there's like a major conceptual blocker with like, no, we can't do this because we don't know this piece of information yet. Cool, so it sounds like we could open up an issue, work with pipeline execution to try to get a new state for pipelines figured out. That is, if a job is not allow failure or includes a retry if that's a thing um change the pipeline status to this new pending failure and then the rest of the notification should just work just work is a pretty loaded term but existing notification mechanism should be able to take that status and do with it what it needs to do How about that? it might uh, putting on my pipeline execution hat it might be easier to move the notification trigger from pipeline failure to build failure and on build failure, like go check the rest of the pipeline jobs and make sure it's not like the 19th failure, then it would be to introduce a new pipeline state. 
a new pipeline state my my oh, gut really big yeah but i you're a lot of people are going to look at you really hard if you try to propose a new pipeline state is my feeling so it, just just a heads up that if if we can use existing the existing states of a different reference object we might be able to move on this more quickly Feels like that would change more behavior though than the new state. Like other bits of business logic that people have built into pipelines are going to change pretty dramatically if all of a sudden we're doing things based on if a single job failed than if the entire pipeline failed. I I think the state is more at the core of that logic though. And the notification, like our notification service is more of like a downstream feature from the state change. And I think a lot of people are hooked into like the particular state changes. So if we can not touch those, but make our integration to the state change change, um, uh, we might be, uh, it will, I think we'll run into less resistance that way. Go ahead, Kyle. What's uh, like, um, is there, is there, um, is there customer needs other than the stuff that we were just talking about for the KPI, like the stuff that I was talking about? Like, I think there's value in sh this shift, but is there anything beyond that's been vetted from with other customers, you think? Here, hey, the the biggest need for a customer is don't make me spend more money. So if a pipeline is going to fail anyway, fail it as soon as you can and save me cash. So okay. if you're on self-managed runners, I don't want to run the rest of those jobs. If I know that I'm not going to get a green pipeline and I can't merge this. Okay. Like that's, that's their underlying need. Um, but the, the majority of customers we talk to like in uh, customer interviews uh, in issues are about help me identify the flaky tests. That's what our persona cares about. And at a high level, let me see flaky tests at the project um, level so that I can proactively tell developers to go fix them or at least research them. Okay. Cool. So Kyle, beyond a change in the notification mechanism or a new state, whichever how we go down that path, but it's that notification happens to a developer when a pipeline will fail or a job has failed, um, build has failed, uh, so they can go back and look at it. Are there other bits that testing could actually build for you around the failed tests or the jobs that had tests that failed? Um, just getting back to the prioritizing the failed test first. I, so I think what was in the test report API is what we need for tooling and that's what we are gonna focus on first, I would say for the experiment in the upcoming uh, release. So uh, your continued support and ideas on how we can look at the results is, I would welcome that. Drew, you all always have great ideas on, on that as well. And we'll keep you in the loop as we continue to experiment. We'll keep you in the loop in the issue, I'll say. We had a things that I've been talking, discussing on an issue right now of a project level table that would show the recent failures and the number of recent failures for the project, for the master, or for the default primary, the base branch, whatever, whatever that is, I forget the term, the default one. Yeah. Um, is that something that you would find useful or do you prefer going to like the actual pipeline um, and seeing recent failures there? So I, for this, I think running, running the tests that failed in the pipeline are more applicable than running the tests that have failed 
the most in the default branch. Um, and I, I could be wrong. If you have both, like, again, we're doing an experiment, we could always kind of do both experiments um, and, and look at the results the same sort of way, just kind of uh, do to uh, not do them at the same time do two controlled experiments I should say um, but um, because that was the other idea that we talked about as a team is if we don't have good enough data on merger the merge request we could just look at what are the most likely re, uh, tests to fail in the default branch and just start with those Talk about multivariate testing. Run all of my flaky tests as part of one job and see if anything, if this pipeline ever gets green. Go. Yeah, the the challenge I see with that is, it, it feels a little bit like a like a self fulfilling prophecy. Like in my mind, the tests that are more likely to fail on the default branch are the most flaky tests. If we're running those in the MRs, of course they're going to be more likely to fail, but they're also the least likely ones that are in the con like in control. Um, you could say the same is going to be true in MRs, um, but I'd rather at least have the experiment be scoped to the data that's applicable in the MRs and test yeah. it that way. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I think surfacing it will be interesting though. And if we can start to get feedback from um, EP and overall quality, of how are we tracking what we perceive to be flaky tests because they're failing on default or on the main branch. Um, that, that would be interesting. Like, are we driving them down like we would tech debt or uh, in measuring them in some other way? Yeah, one thing I didn't do a great job of sharing with you all at, at all is we do have a KR, although we are trying to like rescope our KRs for this quarter around, um, measuring the impact that flaky tests have on the engineering organization. So let me link to that for you. Um, um, our goal, and again, we're kind of rescoping it because we've had a few between the, um, between the experiment that I just talked about and I'll say re-looking at how GitLab bot is used throughout the engineering organization. Those two priorities kind of getting increased in, in visibility throughout the organization. Um, this may get deprioritized a bit, but originally we were gonna have an automated, like the plan was to have an automated, um, automated controls to kind of quarantine and de-quarantine flaky specs based on the amount of impact that they were causing um, and how frequently they are. I'm gonna link the KR. Right here. Right. Um, yeah. I don't think we're going to end up having the automated tooling, but the idea is that we can remove the noise the flaky specs cause. So then when we start looking at the trends over the 14 days in our master branch, we start having much clearer clear signal on what are the what are the problem specs that cause real problems. Yeah. I mean, once we get that table view put together, that would be a great great way to look at this um, or at least see what what today is the highest. And then we can, um, I think this will be a good, uh, selfishly, this will be a good way for us to see how do we want to track those over time. Like this, um, is this test flaky? Is it continually flaky? Have we resolved it? And it's trending downward. It's not failing as much on our default branch. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that and let us know how we can continue to support. Um, I will, so just to sum up our discussion, uh, I will open an issue, Drew and Scott, only and you, uh, you folks to help flesh that out around notification mechanism being moved uh, from pipeline status to build status. Um, it sounds like that might be then the next step in Kyle's experiment after 
running the field, previously failed tests first. That was my takeaway um, and helping drive that outcome for you all. Uh, and then we're going to continue to work on that project level view of the flaky tests and things that are failing on the default branch on and off again um, to hopefully give you some insight into what might be flaky and where you can start quarantining things or focusing on fixing tests. Awesome. Uh, my last agenda item here, if that closes off that discussion, is wondering if we should move this to every other month. Um, I know we definitely haven't had much for roadmap updates lately. Um, I thought this was great discussion, and uh, we've had some good discussions the last couple, um, but we have also had months where we had pretty short meetings. So just wanted to um, check in with Kyle, uh, who's kind of our primary internal customer, uh, but Zeph as well and the team, and see is it worthwhile doing these synchronous discussions monthly or should we move this to every other month or maybe every six weeks as an in-between? I'm okay with the lengthier cadence, but I think Kyle's the only needs to speak to that. Um, I'll, I'll say, uh, I'm okay with, let's try six weeks. I think we do a lot of collaboration async, which is why, which is why I think six weeks is okay. Um, yeah. And we may just do synchronous as needed outside of that, James, if, if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, that works um, for me. Um, yeah, let's do that. Cool. I'll change it um, so that the next one falls six weeks from today instead of in four weeks or whatever the right Thursday is of the month. Um, and we'll, we'll switch that up. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, that wraps us up. I will um, get this uploaded to Unfiltered and share it uh, across the channels. Thanks, everybody, for another great discussion. This was really helpful. Thank you. See you all. Cheers. Take it easy.